Let me get started, Chuck. Chuck's going to lead us in prayer. O oh, righteous God and Holy Father, we come to you in thanksgiving for giving us another day. Thank you for the time that we can be together as a family of yours, to be encouraged and to open your word, and we're thankful for that. Thankful for you giving us these words, and we pray that we will respect them and hold them dear to our heart. Know that uh, the power is in them that can strengthen us to overcome the things that will face us daily, and also some things that we um, feel like we will we can't overcome. We have those examples of those who have done that in your word, and uh, also we have the words that you've given us to tell us that you will be there, you will help us in that way. We pray that we will use this avenue of prayer more often, more dear to our heart, to communicate to you, tell you how much we love you and how much uh, we just, you're just an awesome God. Where it's hard to fathom you considering us and being forgiven to us for as many times as we fall short. Now we do ask for forgiveness as we have failed you, um, been selfish, or just been lazy in our ways. Uh, we ask for forgiveness. We pray that we will have that forgiving heart also to those who have wronged us and actually have a loving heart to those people to draw them close to you and let them know that you desire for all mankind to be saved and to come to obedience to you. Thank you so very much for your son and his sacrifice, and we pray that we will see that not just on Sunday morning as we partake of the emblems of fruit of the vine and the bread, but each and every day that we will sacrifice ourselves also. Be with those who are not able to be out. We consider Eric especially. Pray for his healing. We're glad that he's able to be home, and we pray that Pain will be reduced and healing will begin. Pray that you'll watch over us all. Be with us as we study. Focus on the things that we need to encourage ourselves and to strengthen ourselves and to be more motivated, more excited, and zealous about preaching, get, getting your word out to the community. This we all ask in your son's holy name. And amen. Amen. Thank you, Chuck. Get some feedback. Okay, uh, we have a few with us this evening who weren't able to be with us on Sunday morning as we looked at some of these. So just a real quick re recap of what we looked at. Um, one of the things that we discussed was in a lot of Paul's letters in the salutation, how Paul had, had talked about um, his concern for his brothers and sisters and their spiritual condition, their growth, and, and how he encouraged them. And we talked about, we looked at 1 Thessalonians 5.11, where it says to encourage one another and build each other up. In Hebrews 3.12 and 13, to encourage one another daily. So just the absolute importance of, of each of us encouraging one another in our spiritual family here. So, and then we looked at um, uh, how it's possible to give thanks even during the darkest times in our lives, which that seems very difficult to do. Um, but how even during those most darkest times we can give thanks to our to our Lord and our 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 God, um, and then we started to look at importunity, and we have written up here what we meant by importunity. Just uh, when we look, and we're going to look some tonight at uh, um, some importunate prayers, but just that persistency, that repeated request, going back. Um, some of the commentaries said troublesomely urgent and plead irksomely. And we talked about how E.M. Bounds in his book on prayer, how he wrote that um, part of what an importunate prayer is made up of is the intensity. I mean, you, you don't just have faint-hearted prayers. It's just not kind of lackadaisical going to God in prayer. When we are uh, praying uh, importunately, there's a great intensity, there's a great fervency to our prayers. 
and this perseverance and this persistence is also in our prayers. So some of the things we looked at on Sunday, and then we gave examples uh, briefly on uh, uh, importunate prayers, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now tonight, what we're going to do is, is first look in, um, in Luke, both in Luke 11 and Luke 18, and kind of look at two examples of uh, this type of prayer and um, kind of delve into those a little bit. But if we can, go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 11. And we'll start at verse 5, and we'll go on through 13, through verse 13. So if someone wouldn't mind reading that one first. And as you, as you read those, we're going to look at Luke 11 and Luke 18. But the question here on the page is, contrast the character of the friend and the judge with the character of God. What is the implication from these parables? So keep that in mind as we read these, these passages here. But someone, if you wouldn't mind taking off on uh, chapter 11, verse 5 through 13. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, and go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him, because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks him for fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Okay. Thanks, Taylor. Um, so in this parable here, um, we have, and, and what I was thinking about, can you remember Phil Morgan, and I think John may have brought this up in one of his lessons, how Phil Morgan talked about the friend of his in Sierra Leone that when he got up of the morning, he wasn't exactly sure what he was going to eat when he went, you know, and, and the Lord provided for him for that day. And then when he went to bed, he wasn't sure what he was going to eat the next day. That's kind of what I picture this one friend here. You have the visiting friend, you have the importunate friend, and you have the, the unwilling friend here. So you, you kind of have three friends here. But the, um, I, I kind of picture the, the, the one friend that's going to the unwilling friend, I kind of picture him as Phil Morgan's friend in uh, Sierra Leone, where he just doesn't have anything at, at that point to feed this person. So he goes to, to this other friend here. But um, let, let's go ahead and look at Luke 18, and then we'll kind of make some comparisons and contrasting there. Luke 18, 1 through 8. And your headings on this may say the parable of the persistent widow or the, the parable of the importunate widow here. Could someone read 1, 1 through 8 there, please. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out that day, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? 
I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Okay. Now, I wrote up here on the board in both of these examples here, um, both in the friend and in, in the importunate widow here, you have a not because and a yet. And, and you think of the friend... The friend should want to get out of, give out of love and friendship. But that friend gave out of the importunity of his friend, that, that friend coming back and coming back and, you know, just knocking and wearying him. And he says, it's not because this, it's, it's because of, of, of his continual wearying me. And then the judge should want to give out of, you know, give justice out of, of to give out of justice or concern for the truth. But instead of that, he said, yet it's, it's because of, yet because that widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. It wasn't for the right reason why he should, but, uh, but yet it's because, and we, in that very first verse of chapter 18 there, parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And like we've talked about in this class, oftentimes we have prayers to where they may not be answered for days, for weeks, for months, even years. But our Lord tells us He wants us to keep praying and not lose faith. We should always pray and not give up. And we've talked about how it's in God's time. Uh, where does it, in one of those it talks about, uh, or it may be one that we're going to get into in just a little bit. But I, I, one of these that we're going to be looking at, if it's not in one of these, talks about his timing on these things. Um, so the question there. What is the implication from these two parables when you contrast the character of the friend and the judge with the character of God? Mr. Dan. And we have the phrase, if the squeaky wheel is the one that gets the grease, or squeaky wheel yeah. gets the grease, and that's essentially the way man looks at it. So if, if these unjust people will still give what is asked of them just because of the persistence of the other person, so that's the, that's the squeaky wheel getting the grease. Yeah. But God is not that way. God is much more loving and forgiving. Loving, so, faithful. I Sovereign, think it, so it's the a contrast. Wise. Of, yeah. So it's the contrast that we're given of the if the unjust or the unholy or whatever right. still you know will give in and, and give exactly. what's asked of them, then can you imagine how much better God is? Exactly. Thanks, Dan. And I think is that what okay. Anyone else want to add anything to that? I had down here in my notes, God will not fail us as men who we wouldn't expect to fail, fail us sometimes do. Let me, let me say that again. God will not fail us as men who we wouldn't expect to fail us sometimes do. Even though the judge was wicked and selfish, he granted the widow's desire because of her importunity. How much more will a loving, faithful God give us Give to his children. So. Okay. Anyone else? Any, anything on uh, Thanksgiving and importunity? Let me ask you this. Turn over to James 5. James chapter 5. In the second part of verse 16, the 
prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Um, it, does anyone, that's NIV, what does someone else, what, what's another version of that? Okay, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So how does, um, how does this passage relate to what we're talking about with the importunate prayer here? How, how, does, this, how does that passage, is it 16b, Okay. What else? It, well, well, what I'm trying, what I want to kind of tap into here is that idea of fervency. When we keep going back to God in prayer over and over and over, it, it can't just be a lackluster, it can't just be our heart is half into it, you know, if we really want something and we're, we're continually going back to him as he has told us to do here, our prayers are going to be very fervent. Our heart's going to be into it. We're going to be into it, not just kind of a, a half-hearted prayer. So that's how I think this passage here in James relates to what we're talking about with the, the importunate prayers. John. I did notice in Luke 11, in the King James, it does use the word importunate. Um, and I, I looked up what that literally means, and it literally means without shame. Yeah. And, you, you know, that comes right on the heels of, of the Lord teaching the disciples to pray, which in the context yeah. is Him praying. And, you know, when we think about children coming to their father, he had gone to his father. And we, we think about us going to God in prayer. And, and I don't, you know, to just think about myself. And it's like, well, you know, I don't want to bug, I don't want to bug God with everything. And yet, you know, our children, it's like if my children don't share something with me, I get angry. <laughs> you know, because I want them to share everything. Yeah. It's like I want them to come to me. It's like. If you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have anything, I'm, I'm more mad if you don't come to me than if you bother me too much. It's like, bring your concerns. And whatever concerns Jesus had, it's like, do you think he had any, he was not going to keep them from his heavenly father. Right. He was going to approach his father without shame. He was going to do it humbly, but he had no problem coming to his heavenly father yeah. and that's how we should be yeah it's like this is our heavenly father yeah and just like any child it's like i want to i want to lean on him for yeah. everything and, and it's not like you're saying it's not just the, the huge matters that we take before him it's everything that we take and we're going to be looking at some of those passages this evening too he wants us to bring it all yeah. to him not just the big things i mean i don't know how many times in dealing just with my children where I thought I knew their questions. And so I try to answer their questions. And then I find out what their questions really are. And I had no idea what their questions yeah. and concerns really were. You know, and it's uh, unless they vocalize them or, or whatever, it's like, okay, now I know. Well, of course, our Heavenly Father knows before right, we ask. Right. But still, He wants to hear from us. Yeah. And it's, it is not a, he is not an unjust judge. He is not the friend saying, leave me alone. It's midnight. Are you kidding me? He doesn't sleep. <laughs> he doesn't sleep. He's always there. And he wants to hear from us. And that's what's so amazing about the blessing of prayer is, is like Psalm 8. You know, he wants us to come to him and but somebody that that created all this and he still wants to hear my prayers you know just the blessing of prayer that we oftentimes just don't 
don't take advantage of. Miss Joy. Um, because I am a very literal person and I think sort of in boxes or there's another word somebody else has, had, has said it's not just boxes but it's something else but anyway so so when I have seen these verses before I misunderstood that those meant that my prayers were guaranteed and they are not automatically guaranteed because of these verses because of something that you've already said which was um, God it's in God's time it has to be according to God's will right. and and he won't take away someone else's choice he he didn't with Adam and Eve and he still doesn't with us he gives us our choice so um, uh, I doubt anybody else looks at it that way but I'm I'm learning that that's not a black and white hard um, given yeah, and, it, and it's kind of we kind of looked at that a little bit earlier when we talked about the will of God and how some things that we pray for and we looked at the different wills of God, uh, but how some things just simply aren't according to his will, how, how Christ and Paul both prayed for things to be differently, uh, uh, but they both prayed for his will to be done. And that's what we have to do also. Andrew. I was trying to look at the list of examples from the Old and New Testament of these repeated or uh, without shame, uh, as John put it, kind of prayers. And I was trying to look at a tally of how many were answered versus how many were not, or how many were not in the way of in the way in which the person pray. praying thought. And there's really a lot of examples where it seems as though the thing that the person is asking for ultimately doesn't appear to be granted. Um, Abraham pleading for sparing Sodom for the sake of 50, 10 souls. Ultimately, it's not. Lot, lots evacuated and the city is destroyed. David praying for his child with Bathsheba. The child dies. Uh, Jesus praying before the cross for deliverance, if it be possible. And it was not, so he was not. Paul's prayer for the removal of the thorn in the flesh. So there's there are a lot of examples of this kind of repeated, fervent, type of praying that doesn't seem to be answered in the way that the people want for it to. Um, I thought of one example that was, and that was Hannah in the Old Testament when she prays for a child. And it seems as though that's a repeated occurrence because it says that every time they went to the temple, um, the, her husband's other wife who had children would taunt her for her inability to have children. It seemed like that was a repeated thing. So that was one example that I could find, but it, it does seem like it happens a lot where it's it's the case that the people feel as though their prayers are not being answered. And then I looked at Revelation 6, where the seals are being opened, and there's calamity and there's trouble coming forth when each of the seal when each of the seals are being opened. And when the fifth one's opened, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a, long, with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. And that got me thinking that this kind of repeated and continual hope for something can be, I think it can be cross-generational, where you can have eras of people, entire generations of people who are waiting for something or hoping for something. Uh, we read in the in the Lamentations about how the people wept for their homeland while they were captives, and that was generations while they were gone. You don't think that there were repeated and fervent prayers for the people to return and hopes for them to return. But one thing that I think I see from this example in Revelation is God's people suffering through sometimes entire time periods of, of difficulty 
uh, is not, it doesn't escape God's attention. He's not blind to the, the sufferings that people go through. In this example, they're given robes. They are still given that symbol of purity. They're still cleansed with those white robes and told to rest because there's, there's ultimately more purpose to it than just their own snippet of that time period. So maybe these other examples of people's prayers seemingly not being answered you know, we say many times before, you know, there's things that they don't have visibility of. There's right. things that they're not aware of. There's a bigger, there's a bigger scope, a bigger story happening that they, they're not, uh, they're not the main yeah. plot line all the time. Yeah. Greg and then Dan. So as Andrew was describing this, I was reflecting on the 18th chapter in Luke again. And, and Luke gives a running commentary here in this chapter. He says in verse 1 and verse 9, now this is why Jesus told this account. And he says, he's telling them this parable to show that at all times in verse 1, they ought to pray and not to lose heart. And then Andrew starts talking about praying for things that, you know, we, we say if we pray according to God's will, God will answer those prayers. So does the righteous judge bring uh, uh, legal restitution to his people? And the answer is always yes. The righteous judge, this human judge had his weaknesses and said, all right, I'll give you legal protection because you keep bugging me. But, but God, through Jesus' parable, says, well, I'm the, I'm the righteous judge. And so, verse 7, now shall not God bring his justice to his elect? And when, and when, and you start talking about those under the throne. Uh, those are the elect. Those are the ones that have been designated as receiving God's mercy, grace, his blood. They are his people. They are in his throne. They are the elect. Now, I'm not putting a number on them because that's all, you know, uh, imagery. But the point is, Luke's account of Jesus' words in, in Luke 18 tie in to that scene in Revelation, of course God always brings legal restitution because of his righteousness to his people. There's no question but what he does. But still, Jesus is imploring that we pray fervently for God to do that which he always does. And as we talk about the purpose of prayer and the power of prayer, of course, our prayers are going to be effective and, and, and do much good when we pray according to God's will. But is God still not going to do what God does even if we don't pray for it? There has to be more to Jesus' request for us to put ourselves in an attitude of prayer even when we're praying for that for which a righteous God always fulfills. There's got to be more to it than just the act of asking for that which God has already purposed in his heart to have done before time began. Doesn't there? Isn't there more to prayer than just us asking for stuff that God has already told us he's promised he's going to do for us? There has to be. Otherwise, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And Andrew pointed out these prayers where you know, the people were praying for positive, good things to happen. Sometimes more selfish than not. Sometimes more about other people. But, but God knows what's best. God's going to fulfill that which is best. I think, I think the challenge of, of Luke 18 is trying to understand why it is that Jesus says we're to pray and not lose heart. Not lose heart. These are things God has already promised to fulfill. He's not like a human judge. He's not subject to error. If his people need legal restitution, they'll get it. But Jesus says, pray without losing heart. So that, that indicates to me there's more of an issue with us not understanding God's timing than there is anything else in this whole matter of praying in opportune for that which God has already promised people yeah. to deliver. Yeah. Because we start to think the, the judge down in Citric Court Circuit Court 1, Superior Court 1 is not doing their job if there's not swift justice. 
When you don't think the prosecutor is not doing their job, there's not swift justice. And, 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 and Luke says, Jesus is teaching us to pray in a manner that we don't lose heart. So it's not just about prayer being answered. There's more to it yeah. Yeah. in terms of how we frame our mind in a way to understand the will and the working of God better than if we just sit back and say, time and circumstance, I don't know why that happened the way it did. Maybe God had a hand in it from, from before time. And if we can pray in such a way to acknowledge that and not lose our faith and confidence and trusting that God will deliver, that's, that's an important element to our prayer life, I believe. So we agree. And don't you think that continually going back to his attributes helps us in that helps us in that arena there and and not giving up not losing heart i i think i think this is the key right here to to helping us to not lose heart is just remembering his attributes each and every day so dan well, just to follow up what you just said, these, you know, the friend who went asking for food didn't go to another guy who he saw begging on the corner every day. He went to someone, so he knew that person, it was a friend he knew that would have what he needed, he, what he was asking for. The widow went to the judge because she knew that he was capable of giving that relief, giving her justice. And, he, and the, of course, the child will go to the father because they know the father can give them the food that they asked for, not the, or whatever they asked for. So you have to know God to know what, in the, what you're asking of Him. You have to be familiar with Him. You have to be able to ask of things. Not that we're saying that we're limiting God, as we said before. But you know, if you ask for a, a red Ferrari in your garage every day pers persistently, that ain't going to happen, or it's not something that God's going to, you know, it's just. You know, you can say whatever outlandish thing you want, but it has. You have to know God. You're not going to get things that God's that don't fall in within His right. realm of what He's promised. You know, He's going to give us and what He is. I won't say capable, but of, but He is righteously going to be able to give right. us. Right, and, and we may be looking at that in James tonight. I'm I'm not sure, but we may be looking at some of the reasons He does not give us what we what we ask for. Jim. Yeah, I think some folks have got it turned around backwards. They try to make God their slave, their servant. We're the servants of God. We're his slaves, so we need to get that right. Yep. Now, this is a perfect segue into the next section we're going to be looking at. Does everyone have or does anyone need the... Um, John's got something, and then we'll go. To, to Greg's comment, it was a good comment. And I think there is more to more to these contexts, um, and, and to look in Luke 11 and the the surrounding passages. And you have you have the the friend, the fellow rising up and giving to him. And then the very next um, passage is, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask right, him? Right. And it's like, what are we asking for? And you think about the, the Jews in the first century and down through history, and what were they asking for? You know, we want Rome out of here. We want, you know, <laughs> we, we want to be restored to Solomon's glory. We want all these things. And then the very next passage is, a house divided will not stand. And if you're not with the Lord, then you're against the Lord. And then the very next passage is, an unclean spirit returns after he leaves the house, comes back and it's worse. And then the next passage is, an evil generation seeks a sign. And he condemns that generation. And we know what's going to happen to Jerusalem. <laughs> you know, they pin all their hope on the temple. And, and the Lord says, you better ask for better things than that. You better ask for the Holy Spirit. You better get in fellowship with the Lord. 
That's sort of the context of Luke 11. The context of Luke 18 is, again, it's right after the Lord talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. And to just imagine, what would this country, how would we feel if our country was suddenly decimated? I mean, we, we would be, that's what he just gets done talking about, that destruction is coming, and then he says, he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. How hard would that be yeah. as a Jewish Christian? And it's like, why is God letting this happen? Why would God allow this to happen? Why is God actually being instrumental in this happening? So he tells the parable of the, the persistent widow. And then the very next parable is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You better not trust in yourself. You better come to the just, to, you better come to the Lord. And then the very next passage that Luke includes is Jesus blessing the little children. And what do little children do? You better come to God. You better stop trusting in yourself. You better, it's going to be so easy for those Christians in the first century, especially the Jewish Christians, with what's coming, it's going to be so easy to lose heart when all of a sudden the temple's, temple's gone. You know, even the disciples admiring the stonework, oh, <laughs> admiring it and pointing it out to Jesus. And Jesus says, not one stone's going to be left on another. And it's like, you know that's going to try all of their hearts and minds. And the temptation is going to be to give up. And, he's, and he says, don't give up. The Lord will, <laughs> vengeance belongs to the Lord. The Lord will take care of things in his time. And he, he will avenge, and that is also a part of the destruction of Jerusalem, that he will avenge. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to look at a few of those things. Good. Thanks for putting those in context. And then Miss Choi, and then we'll go on to the next section. So on the two um, uh, examples that we've had in our class about um, the guy looking for food and the widow being delivered from her enemy. Um, I, I guess in my limited knowledge, it seems those two things are reasonable things to ask for, not unreasonable. Um, one would sustain life, or maybe both, actually. So... I guess I have never seen it to be um, a that either of them were in any way selfish or being unreasonable. Right. No, no, okay. not at all. Okay. Not at all. I hope I didn't imply that. Does anyone need the handout for petition and supplication that we'll be looking at? Embrace will be. Um, can someone can someone grab a few of those back there? Um, Petition and supplication. Need a few of them. But the first question there, there are two mistakes at opposite ends of the spectrum regarding prayer. Define deism and what dangers do you see in vending machine approach to petition and supplication? Well, first of all, let's let's talk about definitions. What what are petitions and what are supplications? And what do you think of a petition when you petition someone? And here, urgent request. Request is mainly what it is. Urgent, earnest request to ask, to entreat, and supplications to beseech, to beg for, to plead humbly. Um, but there, there are two mistakes at the opposite end of the spectrum, and we have deism here at this end, and then I've termed it vending machine. Two 
two mistakes at the opposite ends of the spectrum there. Uh, what is deism, first of all? Is anyone able to look that up? Deism. And I guess this was a big uh, thing back in the 16 and 17 centuries. The doctrine that God created the world and its natural laws, but takes no further part in its functioning. He created and then he stepped back and doesn't interfere and he doesn't interact with humankind. So that's deism. That's kind of at this end of the spectrum. Now, when you think of vending machine approach to our prayers, what do you think of? Yeah, it's, it's almost God is like a genie in a bottle. And we, whatever we request, He grants for us. You know, that, that's kind of the attitude there. And, and both of those are at the, at the opposite ends of the spectrum there. What must our overriding motivation in all of our requests be? What must our overriding motivation in all of our prayers be? All of our requests be? God's will. God's will and God to be glorified. Those have to be the two overriding characteristics of our prayers. For Him to be glorified and for His will to be done. When you look at all this here, He needs to be, we need to give him the honor and the glory. Um, anyone else? Anyone have anything to, any thoughts on that? His will be done and, his, and he be glorified. All comes back to honoring God. Uh, John. I liked your vending machine analogy. Just because, you know, we've all come to vending machines before and put in our money and then the bag of chips gets stuck and we get nothing. And, yeah, sometimes we kick it according to Chuck. And we think real hard before we use that vending machine again. And maybe we use it another time or two. But if we don't get what we want. That's a good point. Well, then we stop coming to the vending machine. That's a good point. And I think you can say the same thing about coming yeah, to God in prayer. That's a good if point. If it's not in our time frame, if it's not what we want, if it's not we, if it's not what we feel like we deserve, then why should we come? Yeah. And our mind's not right with God. Yeah. Well, let, let's look at the next question there, James four. It's just about time, but we got. We got a minute or two. James chapter 4. Well, this one I was wanting to do a little more reading than just those two verses. But let's get to James 4 real quick. And I want to put this in context by starting at 3.13. And I'm going to read just a little bit. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Now here's a contrast. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submission, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. And then look what he says after that. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire, that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives 
that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Like Dan was talking about a while ago, the, the, the red sports car. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the Spirit He caused to live in the, us envies intensely? But He gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Then it goes on down through verse 10 there. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. What reasons are given for not receiving what we desire? And then why do we, even fail, why do we fail to even make our request known to God? So where we're... Since we've kind of run out of time there, for Sunday, think about those things in light of what we just read there. Three... Chapter 3.13 down through 4.10. And then, and then think about up there in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, the reasons for not receiving what we desire. So thank you for your comments tonight.